welcome to this Stanford Medicine X Master Session entitled It's COPD, Damn It, with Grace Ann Dorney Koppel and Ted Koppel. Our session today is broadcast live from the Lee Ka Shing Center for Learning and Knowledge on the campus of Stanford University. Today's session will take a deeper dive into understanding the world of chronic obstructive lung disease, also known as COPD. Lung experts will speak on different aspects of COPD challenges, successes, and barriers to research and better care for COPD patients. Our panelists today include Dr. Richard Cassabury, a professor from the Division of Respiratory and Critical Care Physiology and Medicine at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. Christine Garvey, a nurse practitioner who cares for patients with sleep disorders and pulmonary conditions at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Antonello Pontieri, a program officer in the Division of Lung Diseases at the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute at the NIH. Dr. Mark Nichols, Division Chief of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at the Stanford University School of Medicine. And Dr. Arthur Y. Sung, Director of Interventional Pulmonology and Associate Chief of Innovation and Strategy at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Please join us in welcoming now Grace Ann Dorney Koppel and Ted Koppel to the stage. I want to welcome everyone to the COPD Grand Challenge, and it is called It's COPD, Damn It. And as you can see, uh, the panelists are here. Ted and I have met you yesterday. Dr. Tony Pontieri, an NKLBI, Dr. Mark Nichols, Chair of Pulmonary and Critical Care at Stanford. Next to him, another Stanford man, Dr. Arthur Sung, who is a pulmonologist and also has um, great interest and responsibility for innovation at Stanford. Next to him is Chris Garvey, who is a nurse practitioner and an, an experienced respiratory manager, therapist, and a leader of, of people with lung disease to better health. Next to her, is Dr. Richard Casaburi, uh, UC Harbor. Uh, he's one of the gurus, really, of uh, the science of pulmonary rehab. So it is our great pleasure to welcome these people today because they will shed light for all of you who are working on this grand challenge. So this quotation struck me in as much as this is change, and this is the theme of this conference, uh, and it was said pretty long ago, I cannot say whether things will get better if we change. What I can say is they must if they are to get better. We'd like you to watch this video again. Uh, several of our panelists have not seen it. Many of you who were here yesterday uh, have seen it. Uh, the, uh, the founder of the uh, British Boy Scouts once said, nothing matters very much and most things don't matter at all. He was wrong. Some things matter a great deal. 
And the reason we'd like you to see this video again, and uh, if I may, I'd like to ask our panelists, who obviously can't, are you going to be able to see it on that screen? Good. Um, we are putting together a public service announcement awareness raising campaign for COPD. It is not going to be a gentle campaign. It is not going to be a campaign in which actors purport to represent the suffering of patients. The people you're going to see in this video are patients. Most of them got their COPD because they were first responders after 9-11 at the World Trade Center site. Uh, some of the people uh, that you will see are from West Virginia. They got their COPD through a variety of circumstances, but they are all people who curiously knew very little about their own disease. They are frustrated, angry, they are frightened. I ask you to remember all those things as you watch them now, because as you will hear, they use strong language. Please, if you would, on the video. Years. I'm sure that's why I developed this. My parents were heavy smokers. I never smoked a day in my life. Never smoked. My parents did. I said to her, Mommy, you never smoked before. She was not a day. But all my sisters did in the house. And she died from COPD. It's scary because you hear about COPD and the next thing is death. Sometimes it feels like if you were having like a little heart attack, but you're not. It's just that the lungs are getting so restricted and so tight. I can't even wash my own cars now. I used to wash my own car. I used to rake my own leaves, keep my house nice and neat. I can't do any of that now. I cut my life in half. That's what it is. That's scary. It's the first I've ever hearing about that amount of people succumbing to this disease. That's, that's astonishing numbers. I don't want to think about it too much because when I do, I keep thinking that I'm walking around with a cloud of death over my head, that eventually it's going to get me. And, and I, I just don't want to even look at it. That's, that's, that's a shame. Terrible. Think of everybody walking around with it that don't know they have COPD. It's almost everybody. I mean, everybody knows somebody then who has COPD. It's a lot of fucking people. <laughs> that's ludicrous. That's a disgrace. How does that make sense to anybody? It's sad. For the third leading cause of death, we should be spending more money towards finding a cure. This is it? Seriously? People need to wake up and, and, and hear these things. Is cursing allowed? It's going to show that they don't give a shit about people. 
They need to step up and do what they need to do to help the people. It's not ladylike to say what I'm thinking and what I like to tell Congress. If we're losing this many people a year, let's get some more funding. What the fuck are you thinking? You're not thinking. So we have assembled here a panel of some of the most expert people in the area of COPD. Uh, and Grace Ann, these are your friends. These are my colleagues. I do want to uh, mention that the video that we just saw uh, was produced by uh, FCB Health pro bono. They've been working three years on concepts. They did all the interviews with patients. And they produced this. This is not what's going to go out on the PSA. But this is just the Stanford Lancet to give you a sense of the frustration who try to live with this disease. And I have COPD, diagnosed 18 years ago. And living with it is a challenge every day. So with that, let's get a little inspiration. The greatest danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high. We miss it. But it's too low, and we reach it. Michelangelo. And now I'd like you to look at the grand challenge itself. There are five design teams, a, a group of, of talented people who are being led in an exploration as to five challenges. How might we convince Congress to appropriate line item funding for COPD at NIH? consistent with its lethality. And I know that Tony, he can't lobby. I'm lobbying. Challenge two, how do we engage the medical community in earlier diagnosis of COPD? Challenge three, how do we focus attention on the millions of patients who never smoked, those who got the disease through secondhand smoke, environmental and work-related conditions? How might we reduce the social stigma of COPD? Challenge four, how might we make access to attend pulmonary rehabilitation more routine? Challenge five, how do we convince physicians of the need to prescribe pulmonary rehab for their COPD patients just as they prescribe cardiac rehab for their heart patients? How might we get it reimbursed at the same rate as cardiac rehabilitation? And yesterday, we spent time from noon until about five working with teams who have chosen this challenge. And that many of the design leads for the teams are here today. And each team had at least one patient. There were nine patients who are in this together with us trying to make this work. So this is a significant challenge. And I hope that all of you will meet it. Thank you. And uh, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Antonello Puntieri, a program director, lung diseases, NIH. Thank you, Grace Sain, and thank Ted. I'm going to try to manage the time that I have to give you an introduction on the disease. Um, probably you already had it, uh, but I just want to follow up on, on, on the movie, on, on the short footage that you have seen. So these are people, these are people that you know. Most of them are your grandpa, your grandma, or somebody that is related in your family. Could, and uh, for COPD, as Gray Sun was citing those numbers, is really a disease that affects a lot of people in the world and in the United States. Clearly, those 15, 16 million 
are diagnosed, but we know that people that are not diagnosed, either because they are early in their disease, we need better tools to get them. We also need better drugs to target them early once we find them. So what is COPD? COPD is a preventable and treatable disease that makes it difficult to empty air in and out of, of the lungs. The, the way I, I try to convey the experience that luckily I do not have, but the patients have told me is close your nose, put a straw in your mouth, and try to breathe through it. And you'll see how difficult it is just to do it while you're not doing anything. Then think about going around your daily activities, normal daily activities. We're not talking about going out or walking or, you know, going seeing your friends and so on. So the airflow obstruction leads to what we call shortness of breath. And people feel tired. They don't get enough oxygen, of course, around. It's hard to do any, any little things. And you heard it in the movie. You, you, those people that were interviewed, they hardly could respond to the question without catching their breath. Need to work harder to breathe to maintain adequate oxygen levels, as I said. Um, the disease is composed of two and it's very simplified, believe me, in this way, for, for what we know now. But it, two major parts. One affects the, the pipes, the airways, and it makes them swollen, inflamed. And the other one instead destroys the tissues that is supposed to exchange the oxygen and, and gives you good oxygenation. In most patients, we know that there is a, a combination of both. What are the risk factors of COPD? This is from a review from Lancet from 2015. There's a lot of stuff that can take you in that path. And it goes back to, you can see in the map here on the start, there's genetics there. So where you come from, we know that some COPD, it's called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency driven COPD, is because some people are missing a gene that is made in your liver, but then turns out it goes out in your lungs to, to help uh, fight infections or quench the fighting of infection, actually. Um, it's defective, and it turns out that you can chew on your lung, keep chewing anytime you have an infection, and this is what happens to these people. But we know that there are other genes that they can uh, together conjure. If you're exposed to bad stuff, to basically make a damage to your lung. And it could be you have the, the first station there where there is a little uh, kid in utero there and it's exposed, maybe mom smoked or the parents were smoking and maybe there was a, a, a antibiotic treatment at the wrong time. Um, there are other exposures that, that could have happened in, in the early phases of your life and all, all of those can drive bad development of your lung. So think about it, if you start at 100, you can lose a lot before you get down to 50, 70. That is about when people start feeling the disease. But some people don't go up to 100. They stop at 60, 70. So for them, going from 60, 70 to 50, the path is shorter, obviously. And if you put on, on top of that the exposure, then you have the double whammy. Other things that can happen, of course, again, uh, environmental exposure. Uh, we know from from uh, uh, epidemiological study that people that develop COPD, and I'm sorry for the shoulder here, <laughs> people that develop COPD also uh, are, have a history, for example, of frequent infections in, in the lung. Some others have, uh, you see this little kid with an inhaler here, have a history of asthma. Uh, we know that some people, especially women in later stages of their life, uh, asthma, as you probably know, is a disease that is treatable. It doesn't kill as many people as COPD. It, uh, in 10% of the cases, it's called severe asthma. It's really severe and gives hell to the life of these people. But for most of the time, it can be treated with inhaled steroid or bronchodilators. And what happens, those pipes that I was talking about before, they open up. And so they breathe. Normally, they keep their asthma in control. Um, in some other people, that doesn't happen. Progressively with time, the, the pipes uh, keep tightening it up. And finally, on, on, on the later stage, of course, there is cigarette smoking. But as you have seen in the movie, uh, up to a quarter of people have never smoked directly. They are exposed, secondhand smoke, for example. They were the examples that were cited in the movie. And, and again, uh, we, 
we don't know what's happening with other exposure. For example, there is the, the agricultural picture there. And we know, and we are studying that actually right now, that indoor air pollution, not only outdoor, indoor air pollution, so for example, biomass burning, uh, it's a cause of uh, an inflammation that can progress to, to COPD. This is obviously true in places like low middle income countries where, where uh, biomass burning is uh, uh, used heavily, but also in the United States. We have a lot of pockets where people have indoor burning. So it was mentioned, uh, um, these are the data from 2017, the, the freshest that I could find. And that's a lot of people that are dying of, of the disease. And um, Ted uh, gave a comparison. I want to give you another one related to other diseases. And not because I always say it's not that my disease is better than yours. It's just to, to have an idea and to grasp uh, what we are talking about. Uh, Combined breast cancer, prostate cancer, and colon cancer kill about, right now, 100,000 people a year. So that's one and a half time. It's almost as many as people who die of lung cancer. And we have made a lot of progress in lung cancer, probably, as you know, because we have new drugs that are making the life of these people better. And, and um, we are making, uh, again, uh, I, I would say almost miracles for, for, for these people. But who is COPD killing? When you look, I, I did an, an analysis using a, a database that is publicly available from CDC. In red are males and in, in green women. And I, I look over the years and, and in age ranges. And you see more or less the two lines are uh, attached uh, along the time. And please notice the difference in scale. Of course, the older you are, the more deaths we, we have. But they are under my hidden tra uh, Cover comes out that who is really the victim of COPD are the people that are age 75 plus, and most of them are women. You see that from the year 2000, and it's a combination of because we know better how to diagnose the disease, but also because, of course, there is a survival, right? We know the population is getting older, and more women survive than men. And of course, that, that is open for discussion. There's a lot of implications in, in different parts of, of our jobs. Of the, the other important thing to know in all this is where is COPD and who is affecting in terms of geography? If you do not have the data, you can't target interventions, right? And so we collaborated with CDC, which, by the way, doesn't have a specific line item funded for COPD. And so we work in collaboration, means we give them some funds so that they can gather the data for, for COPD. And with this partnership, uh, we were able um, to see where COPD is, not only at the state level, but at the county level, as depicted in this map. This is one of the latest. Uh, in uh, The bluer you are, the more COPD is there. And uh, I'm sure you can't read it. it those little <coughs> square down there are indicating uh, the, the, the prevalence, uh, the, the percentage of people affected by the disease. But what I always say is, yes, the, the bluer uh, areas, of course, the darker area are, are where we should uh, focus most of the intervention. But think about California, since we are, we are here, uh, uh, which is in the white, uh, so it's three 0.2 to 6 percent, but 3.2 or 6 percent of the California population, it's a lot of people, right? So you, you need to look at it also in that perspective. The global burden of COPD within the United States is that it costs a lot of money. 32 billion went on COPD in 2010. The prevalence, as we saw over the average of the previous map, is 6.5. 16 million have been diagnosed. As we said, a quarter never smoked. Millions more don't know that they have it. I don't know if it is another 15, 20 million, as mentioned before, um, but probably it is at least another, for sure, three to five million. And there are different stages of the disease. We know also from data from CDC that rural population have degraded risk for, for COPD. And the, we know also that uh, people in rural areas smoke more, so cigarette smoking I'm talking about. Uh, we don't know if it's strictly related to that or other exposure, as in the previous slide. 
The other thing to know is that COPD prevalently affects uh, low SES people, people in, in, the, in the lower uh, grade of the economical status. And uh, they have more comorbidities. And in blue here are, are people in comparative age and the number of comorbidities that they have per subject. In red, people of COPD. You see the graph is totally shift on the right. It means a person with COPD has at least, on average, three more things that they have to take care of. And since they have also low SES, this brings us the economy of COPD, the individual economy. That means can I afford the drugs to treat all my three, five, seven diseases at the same time? Or can forgive I afford to put table on it? Forgive me for interrupting. Go I've got to be the time police here, and we have a limited time for I'm, all of the guests. I'm and gonna I know be, you want to get to the National Action Plan. I'm going to be there. All right. And so, I'm sorry, I, I'm always carried away when I talk about <laughs> CPD. I, I'm, I'm passionate about it, as we all are, obviously, and, that, and that's why. And so, because of that, uh, because of the passion, we gathered together, we, I'm saying, uh, we, it started from us, uh, but uh, it was through the patients and the patients' organization that wanted us to come up with a plan uh, to tackle the disease. We didn't get specific funds to do this, but, but we got the ideas of the people, and so it was developed at a request of Congress with input from the broad CPD community, that is patient, caregivers, and so on, and it provides a, a comprehensive framework or action, and it, and it uh, hinges on five goals. One that is, number one, centered on the patients, to empower the patients about the disease. The second is to improve prevention, diagnosis, and treatment, so it is directed at the provider, whoever they are. The third is, you have seen from the slides, we need to know where the disease is, and so we need to have the data. The fourth is to do better research to understand what is causing, where we can target the disease, how early can we target. And the fifth, we need, of course, a, a, a national policy educational program to translate what the other four points gave us into action. And so, and we are in all, all in this together. And these are the players. And I'll stop it there. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to MedEx and uh, Arthur Sung, uh, who's a, our head of innovation and strategy in the division and as well as head of the interventional pulmonary program. And I wanted to also personally thank Grace Ann and Ted. Um, so, yeah, there you go. So I, I would uh, like to introduce COPD as we consider the disease in the Stanford Pulmonary Division. And then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Arthur Sung halfway through to talk about what it's like to care for COPD patients out in the community. Um, Arthur and I struck on this image of the Amazon forest fire as maybe a good metaphor for the problem of COPD. Um, COPD, uh, which is the title of this presentation, has a problem with visibility. We're, we're surrounded by people with COPD, and, but we don't see them. And uh, as you know, the Amazon is a, we sometimes consider the Amazon the lungs of the world. There's a conception that it's an important source of oxygen for the planet. There's an article that just came out in Atlantic Monthly uh, just a few weeks ago, which surprisingly stated that that's probably not true. The Amazon is a, it contributes relatively little to the oxygen for the planet. Most of it turns out to come from uh, uh, car organic biofuels from under, or uh, biomass from under the soil. And, uh, and it's the same place where we get our fossil fuels. Nevertheless, the environmental movement uh, has been able to capture this idea and harness it to talk about how irresponsible land use can uh, contribute to the environmental uh, crisis and how it's a threat to the world. And in COPD, we have a real killer in our midst, as mentioned many times, the third leading killer in the United States. And it also involves fire and smoke, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, Arthur and I like the symbolism of it. Uh, and we would benefit as a group if we could somehow uh, figure out how to increase the visibility of this disease, which is what uh, our talk is really about. A, a, a 
a disease that's really, or a, an activity that's really getting a lot of attention that might give us some clues is vaping. So vaping is when you mix nicotine that you extract from tobacco, you mix it with chemical and fragrances, and you can inhale it with water vapor, and it's incredibly addictive. And uh, it's also a disease of the young, which might explain why it gets a lot of attention. Turns out that, as most of you know, COPD is disproportionately a, a condition that affects older patients, and this may be one of the reasons why it's silent. Um, we need to develop more uh, uh, early care principles. We need to have more research in the area, and we need to make it more visible. And so uh, just to call attention to one fact which I, I brought out yesterday to show how little attention it gets at the, at the national level, the National Institutes of Health NIH budget was listed as uh, $39.2 billion a, a couple of weeks ago. And the amount of money allocated to COPD research is 115 million, which is 0.2% of the NIH budget, again, for the third leading killer of humanity. So how do, we, how do we increase the attention to this disease? Well, in the state of California, even though we do better than other states, it still represents 5% of the population. It affects more than a million uh, patients in, or a million uh, people in the country, and it's extremely costly. I, in the interest of time, and Tony did a great job with the epidemiology, I think I'm gonna go right over to what happens when COPD patients get to the uh, uh, an academic medical center. So at places like UCSF at Stanford, we've been able to develop a lot of innovative technologies like bronchoscopic lung volume reduction and surgical lung volume reduction. And really exciting imaging research has shown that we can use uh, radiology to teach us about physiology and biophysics of the lung that can actually uh, enable us to subtype COPD patients and deliver what we call precision care medicine. In other words, we can, we can individualize care depending uh, on what your phenotype is, how you look on a, on a film. You're visiting Stanford today, and uh, this is a historic place for transplantation, which is one cure for very advanced COPD. The very first heart-lung transplant was performed by Dr. Bruce Wrights in 1981. Unfortunately, though, a lot of patients don't have access to these very modern techniques and a way of evaluating patients. Um, if you look at the way an academic medical center is constructed, the way that we come to see COPD patients is usually too late. There's no easy way of having early detection for patients that have COPD. And I think the theme of this talk, or the, the takeaway message of this talk, is that outpatient care is probably the answer. Uh, and so by increasing uh, the attention that we pay for, to patients in the outpatient realm with general pulmonologists and family practitioners and primary care specialists, this is probably part of one of the answers to the grand challenge. Now, if you want an advertisement for why we should value COPD, the U.S. News World Ranking is a, is a good indicator and it's a good advertisement. What's the problem with this metric? They only consider inpatient services. They don't consider how we do in the, in the community and with outpatient care. So this is clearly one area that we could improve on, just like we could with increased NIH funding. I'm gonna conclude my portion of the talk before handing over the microphone to Arthur to just provide this quote by a, a leading luminary in the field, Alvar Augusti. And what he says is the early stages of COPD are often unrecognized. This is partly because they are considered, in, they are not considered in infancy and partly because many older individuals discount their symptoms such as breathlessness, chronic cough, and bringing up phlegm as a normal part of getting older or an expected consequence of cigarette smoking. And with that, I'm gonna turn over the stage to Arthur. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. I do have a confession to make. I cannot claim to be a COPD expert but throughout my career over the last decade, where I served partly as an academic physician 
And then I'm not going to talk about the interventional side of COPD because that's not really the theme of what I want to strike today. But really to talk about what it means to be a fellow human being possessing a prescription pad that I ingrain myself in the community. Throughout my career, I, I lived my high school and beyond life in Palo Alto, the comfort of highly affluent area. I decided for some reason to go to New Orleans uh, to sort of better myself, I thought. And I served the charity hospital in Ninth Ward. I went to Brooklyn. I served in East Brooklyn. Then I went to Stanford. And when I was trying to build this program of interventional pulmonology, I was like, you know what? Why don't I go to the Oakland area, which during the time I was in Palo Alto, I never crossed the bridge. And I learned so much. I really learned a lot from COPD patients because it, it is a common theme of what they talk about is, I thought I'm just getting old because I can't breathe. And that's no further from the truth. And another frustrating part that I've learned as, again, a fellow human being is that part is, is the lack of the educational community to the patients. Most physicians, policymakers, public health workers to say, we got to raise awareness of COPD around the world. Well, it says that as our panel experts did say, COPD is not only a disease of the smoker. Because when I was attending the community in Oakland area, um, the fires in California, the paradise area, I see so many people, not only do they have asthma, COPD getting worse, but people with COPD not knowing they have COPD, and then come to my clinic, I have chronic bronchi I have acute bronchitis for three months now. And that is actually not having been diagnosed with COPD to begin with. So I think it behooves us as the experts of lung medicine to really work with the community providers and educators. And that really is the primary care providers, the urgent care physicians, to equip them ask those simple questions. So we need better screening question. Another questionnaire that was brought up by, published by GOAL, the initiative, is the CAT, or COPD assessment test. And I will also be the first to pledge guilt or admission that in the realm of seeing patients after patients, do I hand you the question of, please fill this out to screen you. We haven't done a good job as a physician. So that's another issue. And then I, I do think that, and just a little personal observation, and the physiologist giants among the panel today, oh, I didn't break it, is that why spirometry is the gold standard. It doesn't observe the patient function from day-to-day -day basis. And I'm hopeful that this conference, that a lot of bright minds connects with data people, artificial intelligence, will be able to provide us a lot better monitoring system, thus help us identify who these patients are from a more functional daily standpoint. So what do we do? So we talk about the what. What do we do with the timing, the when? So now, coming back as an academic pulmonologist, and we offer the high-end stuff, bronchoscopic lung form reduction, surgery, transplant. But again, it's not about when they come to Stanford, because a lot of time, the referral pattern is way too late. By the time we get to them, they are already so far in advance, the quality of life is so affected. So working with the hospital leadership, we decided that let's take advantage of them setting up various locales in the community where we can go to the patient instead of like sitting at Mount Olympus. You know, I was in Boston, you're in the Longwood area, and then here in Palo Alto. No, that's not how you get to the patient. You get to the patient where they are at. So other than Palo Alto, we have San Jose, we have Emeryville, and we have now Pleasanton. Now, not to say that that's pervasive, it touches upon every single patient in the area, but it does help significantly. Let's take Emeryville, for example, which is the top dot. It is a location that is very close to the diverse population of Oakland. Oakland has the affluent, it's a socioeconomical disadvantage. There are a lot of people that have high school education or lower, and a lot of people who are professors at Berkeley. So although that comparatively, the prevalence of COPD is not as high to a lot of the other cities, 
it is not continually declining in terms of the prevalence. So I think it behooves us to, as an institution, to understand that, yes, we need to meet where the patients are and to educate, help the primary care providers. And by doing that, we're able to identify a few barriers as a healthcare system. So I, I didn't highlight so well, so I was, you are not supposed to read this word by word. But let me tell you a life of a primary care physician. They are seeing 20 patients a day, and they are seeing five, 10 minutes each. When the patient has chronic cough, they do a chest X-ray and it shows a shadow. So eventually then, they're prompted to do a CAT scan. So just trust me, it's that 95% of this paragraph talks about a lung nodule that ultimately does not matter. Of course, lung nodule, which is a spot in the lung, all the patients that come see me, I'm, I'm the director of lung nodule also, their life is turned upside down. I get that. I play social work, I play a physician. But that sentence, there are moderate emphysema in the lung, most in the upper lobe, that is skipped. The physicians, primary care, uh, in nowadays, they have to prioritize and to stratify. So this disease has taken a back seat, and that's not right. So this is a screen grab, so please understand the, the resolution is not so great. So now, the primary care physician wants to do a spirometry, okay? And I'm going to use CHF, and I love my cardiology colleagues here, but I'm just gonna make a comparison, okay? In, in, in our medical education through residency and all beyond, it's emphasized on inpatient medicine. The echo to diagnose CHF is talked about daily basis. As a pulmonologist, it's high school physiology, uh, medical school physiology. After that, we don't use that as an inpatient. So primary care physicians are uncomfortable understanding the data spirometry. Now, whether it is a gold standard, there may be a better system in the future, but that is a gold standard. Look at the choices. There's more than 20. They don't even know where to begin, and I'm not undermining that at intelligent level. It's just not their comfort zone. So how do we get them to be more comfortable? That's the other challenge. So final two slides. So I think that lastly is the ownership. Nowadays, in the older days, I'm not that young, but pulmonary physiology is a father of pulmonary medicine. How Lance Armstrong goes on a bicycle hooked up to the mass and understand a human being as a metabolic system, those are the days of pulmonary medicine. Not now. Now we care about lung cancer, transplant, pulmonary hypertension. So, but what we're doing right now is that let's groom young aspiring academic clinician to own back COPD. So what Dr. Nichols is that he's grooming young aspiring faculty to study genes of COPD and then intersecting with programs such as data science, bioinformatics, and artificial intelligence, Stanford, and make them excited about COPD. So what we're doing right now, and again, you don't have to know all the different words, we are finally going back to basic and say, you know what, let's make sure diseases such as COPD, asthma, and I'm just gonna highlight the second bubble right here, which is chronic airway on the right. We gotta focus on these diseases, groom the faculty, educate the community, helping out the primary care in the forefront and the shop end, and we gotta permeate to all the locations on the left side of the bubbles in terms of the places we see patients. So with that said, Mark really talked nicely about using the analogy of the Amazon and vaping, and I think it calls attention. I, I do think we can harness this energy both as a community, physician and patient, to, to really make action. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm Chris Garvey. I'm a nurse practitioner from the other academic center, UCSF. And I have the pleasure of talking about pulmonary rehabilitation today. Um, so, Thanks for the help. Um, so we're talking about COPD. COPD is primarily a disease of the lungs that has some consequence on the other parts of the body, but um, 
we really, when we talk about pulmonary rehab and COPD, we don't fix the lungs. The lungs, they are what they are. We do everything we can to preserve that lung function. What we're trying to do is to fix everything outside the lungs. So where are our priorities? We look at the unfortunate consequences of COPD and they're multiple. Um, beyond the airflow limitation, the trapping of air in the lungs, the stale air, inactivity because a person's short of breath, they're doing less, poor quality of life, uh, poor nutrition, loss of muscle mass, and it's a downward spiral that pulmonary rehabilitation has an important role in reversing. I've been providing pulmonary care to patients for 43 years, and I can tell you when I started, there was nothing. Patients with COPD were told, here's an albuterol inhaler, go home and get your affairs in order. Now it's a different game. There's so much we can do to change things. You know what Pope Francis and Normanetta have in common? Besides the fact they're men, they both have one lung. So there's clearly a lot that can be done in the context of having limited lung function. COPD isn't necessarily a disease of the muscles or the brain. And there's a lot we can do to improve the things that are, have the greatest potential. So exercise is something that's interesting to me and uh, Rich Cassaberry, who's the world expert on the topic. So when we exercise people with COPD, it improves the symptoms. Doesn't make much sense, but it actually does improve shortness of breath. It improves physical function, mood. About 40% of people with COPD have clinical depression, 15% have anxiety disorder. They both improve with pulmonary rehabilitation. Cardiovascular risk, air trapping, that traps stale air. It improves with exercise. So exercise actually works in the context of a uh, pulmonary rehabilitation program. And it's actually very formulaic. The same formula we use for athletes, but modified to the needs of persons with COPD. Self-management, what does that mean? It means learning how to breathe more comfortably, breathe better, not get short of breath when you're going upstairs or hills, how to use your medication effectively. Medication now for COPD is dramatically effective and incredibly safe and really has a pivotal role in this disease. Learning how to cope with the realities, the social isolation, the symptoms, the sense of guilt. People don't get guilt ridden because they have cardiovascular disease that may have been created by diet and lifestyle, but there's an incredible sense of guilt associated with COPD related to smoking. So non-pharmacological treatment, progressive exercise and self-management, controlled breathing, positions where a person can lean forward on a shopping cart or a rolling walker and allow their lungs to swing out more comfortably and improve shortness of breath. Just like you and I, when we exercise, exercise can be in extremely boring. So music, distraction, being around people you enjoy versus people that annoy you. There's a lot that can make exercise much more fun and appealing. So long-term behavior change is really critical. If you've ever tried to go on a diet or an exercise routine, you know that's really hard. And it's particularly hard if you have trouble breathing or you're depressed or all of the above. So my patients, <clears throat> pardon me, their goal is not to use their inhaler properly. Their goal is to go play nine holes or go visit their family or go to a ball game. So how do we facilitate that through self-management and exercise, experimenting with behaviors in a safe setting so the travel and achieving the goals becomes more doable and easier. They're supported by others that are, really have the same challenges. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, so how do we um, conceptualize this? The patient is at the, in the middle, the center where they belong, the primary care doctor, the pulmonologist, the specialist who you've heard from today, training on breathing control, distraction, apps, wearable technology has an important role. 
very exciting role. Um, some of the more novel facilitators, Nordic walking, interval training. I live in San Francisco. Walking the hills of San Francisco is a good example of interval training. So working, then resting. Working, then resting can be much easier for some patients that are breathless. Um, exercise adjuncts, medication, oxygen if appropriate. Um, some people are on bi-level or CPAP at night that might offload the work of breathing. So there's a whole um, recipe of options and alternatives. Um, I wanna thank you for your time today. Um, we're also looking at innovation in the future. Models that can take the center-based pulmonary rehab like I perform at UCSF, and once that's done, having home options to make it something a patient can sustain long-term is very important but we still need to establish the science and you need to help with the technology end. It has to work and it will, I, I'm sure it will. Um, and long-term behavior change. How do we use technology, your brains, our wonderful patients to have a unique combination to keep it working as long as possible? Thank you and it's my sincere pleasure to turn this over to Rich Cassaberry. Thank you, Chris. Uh, my name is Rich Cassiberry. I'm from uh, Harbor UCLA down in Los Angeles. Uh, I've been working in the COPD field for many years and very specifically for in, in pulmonary rehabilitation. I have a lot to say and I don't have much time to say it, so you'll uh, have to bear with me. Hope we get the slides up in a second here. Excellent, excellent. Uh, my topic is uh, pulmonary rehabilitation, where we've succeeded and where we frankly failed. Um, the outline of the talk, we've succeeded in establishing, as Chris pointed out, a firm scientific basis for patient relevant benefits. What we found is that those benefits are not available to the vast majority of people who would benefit. And then I hope to suggest a path forward with which we could uh, use uh, all the help we can get. Uh, Chris went through this pulmonary rehabilitation does things like improve exercise tolerance, improve symptoms of dyspnea, very important to the patient, improves health-related quality of life, and does this better than anything else we have for the disease. Proven. It does a lot of other things, decreases exacerbation, COPD flare-ups, other measures of healthcare utilization, reduces depression and anxiety, improves cognitive function and self-efficacy, and I think it improves adherence to drug therapy. All good things. If we look to sort of our Bible of our sort of guidelines for COPD, the gold, the gold guidelines, uh, which updates every year, here's the 2009 statements. The benefits, the benefits of COPD patients from rehabilitation are considerable, and rehabilitation has been shown to be the most effective therapeutic strategy to improve shortness of breath, health status, exercise tolerance, and these have been demonstrated across all grades of COPD severity. Pretty impressive. Proven, proven, we've established the benefits. But how about the problem with availability? And I wanted to sort of consider a little thought experiment for a minute. We consider there are three major COPD treatments we offer to patients. There's a few others, but these are the major ones. Bronchodilators, supplemental oxygen, and then pulmonary rehabilitation. These are the relative benefits and this is a synthesis of many clinical trials, and I think it's pretty solid. We consider exercise tolerance, dyspnea quality of life. Bronchodilators, you do a big trial, you can show that exercise tolerance has improved, dyspnea is reduced, that's good. Quality of life is better. Oxygen for people who need it, a little bit better. And pulmonary rehabilitation, clearly better than all. You can show it in small trials that these benefits accrue. Let's talk about availability, and I think you know what's coming. Bronchodilators are available nearly universally. Go to a physician's office, you have COPD, you're sure to walk out with some score of a spritzer of an inhaler of some, of some sort. Oxygen therapy, if you qualify for oxygen, you will get it. We'll make sure that you get it. Rehabilitation, only a few percent of patients who would benefit get rehabilitation. 
Here's a study that shows that very nicely. You have Medicare claims data, millions of people in this database, and they crunch it through and crunch it through, and found out that in 2012, latest year available, 3.7% of patients were receiving it. And that's an underestimate because a lot of people who don't have Medicare are more, less likely to get rehabilitation than those who do. Well, 3.7% is an upper bound. Another study, you're hospitalized for a COPD exacerbation, teachable moment, right? You come out of the hospital, 223,000 people were hospitalized in 2012. 1.9% of them received rehabilitation within six months, 2.7% within 12 months. Uh, and it gets worse if you were living more than 10 miles away from the rehabilitation program, you're less likely to get it. If you're lower socioeconomic status, you're not gonna get it. If you're black and Hispanic, lower chances. That can't be right. Is it because rehabilitation is so expensive we can't afford it? No, the annual costs are really similar. And if you look to the, this is a British uh, analysis uh, with this sort of pyramid of cost effectiveness, how many quality adjusted life year sort of things, flu shots, very bottom, do it, very cost effective. But there's rehabilitation number three, all the pharmaceuticals are above that, less cost effective. Rehabilitation is quite cost effective. Why does this exist? Now this is important, and I wish I had a minute to let you think this through about what do Bronco dollars have that rehabilitation lacks? Da -da 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 -da. It has marketing. People go to the doctor's offices, here's my new drug. TV, come on, can you, can you sing the jingles for COPD? You can, you can, you can. They have marketing. What about oxygen? Why do we give oxygen to everybody? Because it improves survival. My, my mentor, Tom Petty, 40 years ago, published paper saying, sponsored by NIH, great NIH, early NIH clinical trial. You don't get, if you randomize people who are hypoxemic, to oxygen or no oxygen, the people who don't have oxygen die. The ones who have oxygen live. You can't deny it if you have a survival advantage. Therapies that improve survival have a high priority for patients, their physicians, and for the healthcare system in general. So rehabilitation has no marketing. You don't have people in doctor's offices promoting rehabilitation. And it, doesn't, it has not been shown to prolong survival. So what are we gonna do about it? This is the path forward. We need marketing. We need to demonstrate a survival advantage. We need marketing. There's plenty of information out there about rehabilitation. It's available on the web. You can plug it in. I'll show you three different sites. This is COPD Foundation has a wonderful website. We're looking for people who look like me who have COPD. Go there, you'll find all this information. Live Better with COPD is an ATS uh, funded uh, livebetter.org uh, website, very good about pulmonary rehabilitation. This is our own sort of uh, local one, uh, PERF, uh, Chris and I uh, belong to this, go there. You'll find all kinds of information about, uh, about rehabilitation, why you should do it, how you can get it. But these don't get penetration. Hundreds of people go to these websites, maybe thousands of people go to the website, not the millions of people who would benefit. We need to do better. We need to demonstrate a survival advantage, okay? And this is my uh, dream, Rich Cassiveri's dream, that someday we'll have a New England Journal of Medicine article that say pulmonary rehabilitation improves survival in COPD by the pulmonary rehabilitation investigator group, okay? And I think that if we had this demonstration, it would reformulate pol public policy. It would make patients demand it. It would make doctors demand it, and we would get up on a curve and have much more, uh, better, uh, much better availability. How are we gonna do this? Well, this is a group of, uh, of old guys who got together and said, we, we need to do a study like this, put together a study, got all our friends together, designed a study, and said, let's, let's do this study. Well, the study looks like this. We think we need about 1,500 patients who have been hospitalized with COPD exacerbation, come out of the hospital, and either get rehabilitation or not get rehabilitation, and follow them for a few years. See how they do. See who gets rehospitalized. See who dies. 
It's a, it's a time when people have a high potential for dying. This is a good study design. Follow them for two years. We need about 20 sites in the United States uh, to do this, this 1,500 patient study. Well, it's a seven year project, turns out to be. Do the crank, do the crank, uh, crank it up, do the math. And it costs, we think, conservatively, about $28 million. Is that a lot or a little? Uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot of money. But what, how could we fund this? Well, the traditional funding source, and they, they do a wonderful job, is my friend Tony here, you go to NIH, and they fund studies of this type. But they fund very few studies of, of this large. And you saw the COPD budget, and you should say 28 million, 30 million, that, that's a large fraction of what they can fund. They can fund five smaller studies before they can study a uh, funded study like this. And I just would like to do it, but may not be able to. Well, how about the pharmaceutical industry? They fund lots of studies this big, lots of them, all the time they do it, but they're not gonna fund a rehabilitation study. And another funding source be identified. So I'll, I'll sort of con con conclude with this. The, we need to develop marketing strategies for patients and providers. We need to develop a source of funding for crucial large scale uh, clinical trials and rehabilitation. And innovative strategies are welcomed. Thank you. This is the point in the program where um, we would like to open open up the the panel, answer any questions that you may have, and to do this deeper dive into the five challenge areas. And if I may, I'd like, first of all, uh, just to clarify what appears to be a discrepancy. Tony referred to uh, COPD as being the number four killer uh, in this country, and we all are insisting on referring to it as being the number three killer. It is the number three killer among chronic diseases for reasons that only someone who works for the federal government can understand. At some point or another, the distinction was made that if we take the category, an arbitrary category, of people who die of suicide, traffic accidents, slipping in the bathtub, um, but also opioids. Opioids. That's, that's that's what, that's if you, if you put them all together, they add up. Pulmonary rehab does not make a lot of money. In fact, it is a very cheap form of treatment. Inhalers, quite expensive. The pharmaceutical companies make a ton of money from their inhalers. We're not asking that people stop with these wonderful surgical procedures. We're not asking that the drug companies give up their, profit, uh, their profits. What we are suggesting, and I'd like to get the reaction of any of our panelists here, what we are suggesting is that collectively, collaboratively, if we have the final surgery, if we have the inhalations, and if we add to that pulmonary rehab, we will be treating a desperately at need population in a much more effective fashion. So whoever would like to pick up on that note, we have a question in the back. Yes, ma'am. I still think they didn't turn your mic on. Can you hear? Yeah. Okay. There we go. Good morning. I'm Brandy. Um, I was a fellow here, and when I was working here as a fellow, one of my big projects was working with the Palo Alto Cardiac Rehabilitation Center. It's awesome. Um, one of the things that I found was profound was the community. So you had people there that had had, um, you know, open heart surgery or had a stent placed 30 years ago, and they are still coming to the rehabilitation center um, out of their own pocket. They're willing to pay. They are paying for the community and the connection 
And so I'm wondering if there might be an opportunity for the same thing for the pulmonary rehabilitation community to promote. And I wanna hear about those opportunities that people have discussed. It's a terrific point, and you're absolutely right. The answer is yes, but here's the here's one of the world's leading experts. I completely agree with you. I oversaw one of the largest cardiac and pulmonary rehabilitation programs in the country, and the program unfortunately closed. This is a sad reality we're seeing in the United States, and the and also the reimbursement has been a challenge. Um, but it, the community is so important that my patients three years later still get together for lunch. They keep an eye on each other, they call each other, where are you, are you okay, do you need anything? They feel that they're not alone. Unfortunately, when they're out trying to do things like get through a shopping center, they feel completely alone. So it's very powerful to know that they're still a person, they have a excellent working brain, they still have a heart, they still have kindness, and they can still produce if they're given an opportunity to know the things that you described. Chris, may I just add, when you talk about reimbursement being a challenge, I should point out reimbursement for cardiac rehabilitation. Exercise, how does that sound? It doesn't sound very good, but it's done in a way that works. Patients need oxygen. They have, as you mentioned, many comorbidities. They may have depression, heart disease, um, musculoskeletal disease. So I, I think, and I think I, there's a reasonable uh, basis for this, that pulmonary rehabilitation is actually much more complex. And to get paid half is the wrong direction, if you would agree. Yeah, I, I think you've uh, almost underestimated, understated the, the case. First of all, I think cardiac rehabilitation is underfunded as well. I, I don't think we, shooting for, the, for for that level is really well, I guess better, but not nowhere near adequate. Uh, th and the, the differences are really pretty profound. Somebody who has an ab abrupt cardiac event and comes to cardiac rehabilitation remembers what it's like to be active, remembers what it's like, and, and, and it's like getting back on the horse. Somebody with COPD generally has had 20 or 30 years to learn how to be sedentary because of their shortness of breath. And getting them motivated is something that only a very good motivator of people like Chris can do. It's a real skill. It's why inpatient, in-center programs are really the thing to do because you can't do this without somebody to guide the issue of having people with similar disabilities working next to you is also a key component. This is why it's so effective. Let me, if I may, just raise one question. Somebody here, and I forget who it was, uh, referred, and I'm not quoting them precisely, but to COPD as being essentially an old person's disease. I'm the layman here on the panel. I disagree with that perception. It's not an old person's disease. It's a disease that tends to be diagnosed in old people. It is a disease that actually hits people much earlier. And one of the major problems with COPD is that we are insufficiently adept at diagnosing it earlier. Anyone who'd like to pick up on that? Sure. That, that's totally correct. Uh, I mean, the panels that, that, that I showed are, are mortality, but it's the end of the path. The disease starts very earlier, and that's why we need more research to try to target that, that early step, uh, point, because we don't know if the drugs that we have today at our disposal could work to stop the disease at that time. And there are many more new drugs out there that need to be tested. So we need to somehow, and uh, that's through research, uh, finding out um, new questionnaires, for example, that can screen people, like the CAT assay that was um, mentioned, to see if we can get these people early and uh, start to treat them and see if we can make a difference early. I'd like to say something. The tragedy is that not only are we diagnosed late, but we are diagnosed at a very vulnerable time in our lives. We're, we're in middle age and we're feeling 
other signs and symptoms already. And to break this cycle, not only do you have to diagnose earlier, but you have to have a therapy that can give people hope and give their lives back. So I was diagnosed 18 years ago. I did pulmonary rehab. I've continued it for the remainder of these years. So yes, it would be great to think you're gonna live longer, and I want to, because you can prove it scientifically. I can tell you I have seen it, not only in me, but I've seen it in patients in the Grace Ann Dorney Pulmonary Rehabilitation Centers. I've seen people go in broken and finish feeling empowered because they do have enough of their life back that there's meaning in life. So we don't have to wait. I, I want a huge clinical trial to show there is a mortality benefit. But I have, I have experienced it, and I've seen it in the hundreds and hundreds of graduates in these programs in rural America. Honey, we have a question up there. Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. Yes, you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric, and I'm coming from an AI research team. So I'm really excited about, I think, the potential for this, this disease. Um, and one thing that I was really curious to get um, a few points of distinction on from the experts in the room is with this problem of underdiagnosis. And I'm curious, uh, from your perspective, is the greater problem here that patients with Obvious symptoms just don't aren't educated enough to know where to go for the right resources and to you know interact with the healthcare system properly to you know determine a diagnosis, or is it that some patients may not even have salient symptoms for themselves, but with the right tests and the right procedures, these things may be discovered. Uh, so I'm just curious what that distinction is. Is it more of an, a patient education problem, or do we need to determine new ways to interpret scans and interpret EHR data? Uh, that would be really interesting to hear more about. Um, I think I'm going to give the mic right back to you. I'm not, I, I don't consider myself an expert on this problem, but I do consider it a logic issue. If And, and I've, I've gotten a lot more educated about COPD in the last few weeks. Um, we deal with many different types of pulmonary diseases, and that's part of the problem. Um, the, the problem is, is that it's an incredibly common disease. So if, if we're saying that even in California that one out of 20 people have it, but then you go into these rural areas where maybe one closer to one out of 10 people have it, then the first part of the question is you gotta get access. You gotta know who, who has it, and they may already have the symptoms. So that's, so that's gotta be, I think, near the top of the list. Then the early detection piece, uh, and, just, and I, I invite the rest of the panel to comment on this, that, that is the next thing. But if you just talk about a public health concern, we got to get all the people that are not near these uh, these centers that can do the really easy tests and figure out a lot of the problems, even as we're developing early diagnosis. And I'd like somebody else to answer that who's been working with this longer, maybe. Well, the, 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 the mistake a lot of physicians make is to uh, uh, use a one-item questionnaire. It's sort of, how you doing? Uh, fine. I'm fine. Uh, you feeling okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Um, doing what you feel like doing? Uh, yeah, 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 I can do what I feel like doing. Uh, how many flights of stairs can you climb? I don't climb flights of stairs. I get short of breath when I fly, climb stairs. Ah, now, now, we're, now we're getting somewhere. So I, I think it's up to it, incumbent on the physician, really, who sees patients, to, be, to probe a little bit more, especially with people who have risk factors. And with all due respect, the number one risk factor is cigarette smoking. Those people need, need to have uh, more in, intensive questioning. There's an argument that says you don't do testing until the patient has symptoms, but they deny symptoms, so how do you know? And it's, it gets very confusing. But the key thing is to try to elicit symptoms and when there's any suggestion to get testing. Now, spirometry is not rocket science, for crying out loud. You blow into a machine, comes up with a number, tells you whether it's normal or not. Uh, and, and it's not the best test in the world, not the worst. But it does, it does get us someplace, and I think we just don't use it enough. Um, hi there. Uh, my name is Devin Lowe, and I am a COPD patient and uh, an e-patient with Medicine X. 
I was diagnosed with COPD in 2011, uh, and I had been diagnosed with childhood asthma 40 years earlier. Um, and so because I've worked in a profession which didn't allow me access to regular health care, I worked in, um, in professional theater, so it's kind of a vagabond life. And so um, I just thought it was just poorly managed asthma for years, and my only access to health care was through public clinics. And um, they just said, well, you just have asthma. And so it just became sort of an accepted routine for me that I would just go to the emergency room two, three, four times a year. And it wasn't until my last visit in 2011 when, and this is a bit of a tip into healthcare insurance, that my last emergency room visit in 2011, uh, the doctors said, you know, have you heard of this comprehensive healthcare plan that San Francisco offers called Healthy San Francisco? And uh, you could see a pulmonologist at low cost because as a theater professional, you don't make a lot of money. And so uh, I went to a pulmonologist for the first time in, what, 50-something years of having asthma. And they put me on a treadmill, and they did the nose, blow it to this, and the whole thing. And that's when I was diagnosed with COPD. And so I went from one inhaler and a rescue inhaler to three inhalers and a pill and the rescue inhaler. And now I recovered. I mean, my lung function was never very good. They say that when you get diagnosed with COPD, you already lost 50% of your lung function. When I was diagnosed, I was already down, to, I had already lost 60% of my lung function. But with medical adherence, uh, I have regained a lot of my life. You know, I run slower, but I mean, by running, meaning my, my activity level is, is better than it was a decade ago. Um, and, but to answer the question about, um, so that was my story. And so it, it's, 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 nobody ever thought to even think, be a pulmonologist. But also because of the way the healthcare system was structured, it would have cost me hundreds of dollars to see a pulmonologist. So that's gonna be out of the question if you're low income. So you're stuck with this option of, well, okay, I use rescue inhalers. Um, now my rescue inhalers expire before I get through even 25% of them. So that's, that's my story. Wonderful, wonderful story. Thank you so much. Perfect. Pitch perfect. I just had a remark. I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, doctor. But regarding doctors who ask the question, well, how are you? Oh, fine. Um, I come out of the cancer world. I've had cancer three times. Oh, my name's Lisa Bernstein, and I'm in part of the, the e-patient program and e-patient advisor here at Medicine X. One of the things we see a lot in cancer, of course, are all the side effects from treatment. And I've started seeing discussion on Twitter amongst oncologists that an interesting way to approach the question is to say, what's bothering you? And it gets the patient to perhaps think of things in a less <clears throat> stressful or threatening kind of a way. It's like, oh, well, I can't climb the steps anymore like I used to. We, we call this patient-centered, patient-focused, uh, you know, fancy word for it, but it's exactly, exactly what you say. And, and I, I think it's, it's that, that, sorry, sorry, I don't want to hog things, but it, it really is, is appropriate to say that the treatments that we have for COPD is sort of glass half full, glass half empty. The glass is half uh, empty because they don't do everything. They, they, they can't fix things, even rehabilitation can't fix everything. But they're all very safe therapies. The inhalers, you know, a little here, but they're pretty safe. Don't make your hair fall out, you know? And rehabilitation, done right, it's safe, safe therapies. That's the good part of COPD therapy, I think. Please, please. I wanted to reiterate the point, though, that it's not an acute effect. You unfortunately get an acute disease, you get an acute treatment, you're gonna look at the side effects. COPD sneaks upon you, and you get used to it. And so you adapt, you sit more on the chair, you watch more TV, you reduce your daily activity. And so when they're going to ask you what's bothering you, nothing. My life is normal because I went down and adapted. And so going, going back to your question also, I wanted, I wanted to add, it's a mix of, of both. It's uh, informing the, the public, 
people at risk that you've seen in the slide. There are many things that could determine if you're gonna get COPD or not. Smoking, of course, but 25 never smoked. Maybe a second and smoke exposure. The National Action Plan is hitting at that. That's goal one, empower the patients, but also the person at risk so that you're more knowledgeable. I, I have to say, I, we also get good benefits from the commercials that you see every night on TV because they make a COPD and household name, even though, of course, they're going and aiming at selling a specific product, but at least uh, they, they could trigger the curiosity. And, and the other point, goal two, is uh, empowering the physicians, the health, and not, not necessarily just the, health, uh, the physicians, but healthcare provider, whoever that person is. Because uh, let's go back to the example of pulmonary rehabilitation. Uh, I, I went to some of the clinics, uh, actually, uh, where Ray San was too, and you could talk to the physicians there and see I was not a believer. <clears throat> And so uh, until I saw my patients coming back from the dead, basically. And so that, that's, that's the, the thing, you know, and it, it's a question of culture, of course, education, learning, having the data, as, as Rich was saying is, oh, by the way, at one year, you're not gonna be dead. Hi, um, my name's Alicia. I'm one of the e-patient um, leads here at Stanford. And I'm also a three-time cancer survivor, so. <laughs> um, but the, my question is to Grace Ann. Um, the, the challenge lays out some very specific things that you can attack. Um, but if, from, if you're looking at it from sort of this crawl, walk, run kind of um, strategy, out of those challenge items that you've listed, w do you see a clear priority? I mean, I, there's so many ways that you can attack. There's, there's the awareness angle, there's the fundraising, angle and um, you know I've done a lot of work in the breast cancer community and, and seen how that community has sort of grown over the years and it, I feel like we have an obligation to help you shorten that crawl walk run um, kind of uh, strategy that you want to work on and I, I'm just wondering if there's things from the breast cancer community that we can share with you that might help you prioritize those items because it is, for me, it's an awareness act issue that leads to additional funding that, you know, but sometimes that you might need the funding before the awareness. So is there a priority that you see or? Well, I'll let Ted speak to this okay. too, but with Thank $100 you. million dollars a year for a disease of this magnitude mm -hmm. that has so much impact on people's lives, if you don't have the funding you can't do anything. So yes, we've got to continue to raise awareness, educate people, educate primary care doctors. But unless we get a ton of money, like the moonshot for cancer, billions, like um, the Million Hearts campaign, and maybe we don't need billions, but $100 million gets you nothing in research these days. So I think it's a combination of funding, building community, learning from you and how you gathered together the breast cancer community, building that community within COPD. But every one of those challenges could make a significant impact on the lives of 30 million people. Um, look, COPD has been and continues to be the stepchild among major chronic diseases. There is, uh, some of you may have seen it yesterday, there is an app which absolutely fascinates us, uh, which I, I gather was actually created in the United States but developed in China. Uh, very simply stated, it is an app that permits you to take your iPhone and blow onto the microphone. And it tells you within a matter of seconds that your lung capacity is at 80%, 70%, and then it tells you if your number is below 70%, go see your doctor. 
It strikes me as being such a simple device. You were asking before about what we can do to identify the people out there who have COPD but don't yet know it, to get to people earlier in the game. That is so critical. You know, to start treating people when they're in their 70s is important. They want to live just as much as anybody else does, and the quality of their life has to be improved. But if we can get to people when they're in their 50s, 60s, 30s, and 40s, and say, you know something, if you follow these protocols, you can live a long and full life. You've still got COPD, and it's still an incurable disease, but incurable it may be at the moment, and we're trying to raise the money so that good people like Tony Poncieri can, can bring us a solution ultimately. But probably none of us in this room, with the exception of a few of you very younger people, is going to see the day when, he, when we have a cure for COPD. But right now, we're not even making available. You saw those numbers. The percentages are pathetic. Less than, what, 3%? That's Roughly 3% of people with COPD have access to pulmonary rehab, and pulmonary rehab works. Now, I, I want to be the time police. We have exactly <laughs> one minute left. Rich, oh. Rich has the mic. And I, I'm not sure I have the should have the last uh, last say. We talked about early disease, and I I, I had this this thought in relates to rehabilitation. Whereas, if you give a patient with a very mild disease, you give them bronchodilators, you give them the other therapies we have, it really doesn't help all that much. It it's only the more severe patients who really feel the benefits. Rehabilitation works across the board, and early in my my career. I did research with some Italian researchers who had a hospital for men, middle-aged men with COPD who came for the cure. They would, they would run around in, in jogging suits and they would go back to work, not just get out of bed. You take the more severe patients, they get out of bed. You can get them back to work. Rehabilitation works over a very wide range of people. And again, 3% is not enough. So many of our panelists here have come a long distance or overcome uh, personal illness to be here today, and I'd like you to please join me in giving them all a big round. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this Stanford Medicine X master session entitled, It's COPD, Damn It, with Grace Ann Dorney Koppel and Ted Koppel. Our session today was broadcast live from the Lee Ka Shing Center for Learning and Knowledge on the campus of Stanford University. We hope you enjoyed today's live stream broadcast of Stanford Medicine X, one of the most discussed academic medical conferences in the world. I'm Dr. Larry Chu, Professor of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Medicine at Stanford and Executive Director of the Medicine X program. Thank you for joining us today and we look forward to your continued engagement with our program and our Medicine X Educational Grand Challenge on COPD this year. Don't forget to join us on Twitter on our hashtag MedX and follow us on YouTube on Stanford MedX.